And those who are truly in Messiah, Yeshua, do not uh, need external coercion to keep God's commandments and judgments. For when we have been given a new heart and a new spirit, there arises within us a desire to keep God's laws and commandments. So this week continues on. It's uh, number day seven of repentance week, month, 40 days of repentance. And um, one of the important th things is understanding from last week the importance of getting to people, the world and getting countries and nations to actually repent. And um, so... So when you're actually doing it for yourself, be praying for the our country. Be praying for all countries, okay? Um, that they may come, they may see their ways, and turn from their ways. It says, "Seek my face." To Helen, twenty-seven, Psalms twenty-seven. Adonai is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? Yeah. Adonai is the, is the stronghold of my life, whom should I be afraid? In fact, that's an interesting one, that stronghold is much more powerful than the strength. Yeah. Okay? Sure. It's often was tra translated as, as yeah. strength, but in actual fact, it, the word is actually stronghold. Um, because we have other things that are strongholds in our life, isn't it? Right. Yeah. But the most important thing is to make sure that Adonai is the stronghold yes. Yes. of our life. <clears throat> and then nothing will come against it. Um, whom should I dread? When evildoers approach me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my foes, they stumbled and fell. A camp, this is me, Will not be there. breaks out against me, even then, comforting Adonai all the days of my life, and behold the beauty of Adonai to meditate in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will hide me in his sukkah, conceal me in the shelter of his tent, and set me high upon a rock. Joel and I have been trying to remember that off by heart this week. And that's our verse for today. You'll hide me in our sukkah. So we break out on, we break out into it just randomly. It's good. It's good for my brain. The more I learn, the more I in there. So we're going to sing a shema today if you um, if you'd like to stand please.
singing. Yeah. It does your heart good, doesn't it? Yeah. Sing. <laughs> and let's sing for the people that are not here too. So we'll do them good.
doing this work. Thank you, Lord, you are good. Uh, in 
I need to come against them because they will tremble and fear. Yes, you are the light and the salvation of our lives. Yes. You are the stronghold of our lives. Yes. Whom shall we fear? Yes. Whom shall we be afraid? And as I said again, it's the day seven of repentance. So let's enjoy the readings. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Good to be with you. As I'm reviewing my reading, I'm thinking this is the foundation for Western civilization's law. And uh, how powerful, how much... Western civilization has given to the world how much Adonai has given. So we're starting in Deuteronomy 16, verse 18. You are to appoint judges and officers for all your gates in the cities Adonai your God is giving you tribe by tribe, and they are to judge the people with righteous judgment. You are not to distort justice or show favoritism, and you're not to accept a bribe, for a gift blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of even the upright. Justice, justice only, you must pursue, so that you will live and inherit the land Adonai your God is giving you. You're not to plant any sort of tree as a sacred hole beside the altar of Adonai, your God, that you will make for yourselves. Likewise, do not set up a standing stone. Adonai hates such things. You're not to sacrifice to Adonai, your God, a cow or a sheep that has a defect or anything wrong with it. That would be an abomination to Adonai, your God. If there is found among you with any of your gates in the city that Adonai your God gives you, a man or a woman who does what Adonai your God sees as wicked, transgressing his covenant by going and serving other gods and worshiping them, the sun, the moon, or anything in the sky, something I have forbidden, for, forbidden and it is told to you or you hear about it, then you are to investigate this matter diligently. If it is true, if it is confirmed that such detestable things are being done in Israel, then you are to bring the man or woman who has done this wicked thing to your city gates and stone that man or woman to death. The death sentence is to be carried out only if there was a testimony from two or three witnesses he may not be sentenced to death on the testimony of only one witness. The witnesses are to be the first to stone him to death, and afterwards all the people are to stone him. Thus, you will put an end to this wickedness among you. If a case comes before you at your city gate, which is too difficult for you to judge concerning bloodshed, civil suit, personal injury, or any other controversial issue, you are, not, you are not to get up, go to the place which Adonai, your God, will choose, and appear before the Kohanim and the Levim, and the judge in that place at that time. Seek their opinion, and they will render a verdict to you. You will then act according to what they have told you, and they're in that place which Adonai will choose, you are to take 
care to act according to all their instructions. In accordance with the Torah, they teach you, you are to carry out the judgment they render, not turning aside to the right or to the left from any burden. And presumptuous enough not to pay attention to Kohen appointed there to serve Adonai your God or to judge, that person must die. Thus you will exterminate such wickedness from Israel. All the people will hear about it and be afraid to continue acting presumptuously. When you have entered the land Adonai your God is giving you, have taken possession of it and are living there, you may say, I want to have a king over me like all the other nations around me. In that event, you must appoint as king the one whom Adonai your God will choose. He must be the one of your kinsmen. This king you appoint over you, you are forbidden to appoint a foreigner over you who is not your king. However, he is not to acquire many horses for have the people return to Egypt to obtain more horses, inasmuch as Adonai told you never to go back that way again. Likewise, he is not to acquire many wives for himself, so that his heart will not turn away, and he is not to acquire excessive quantities of silver and gold. When he has come to occupy the throne of his kingdom, he is to write a copy of this Torah for himself in a scroll from that one the Kohanim the, and Levim use. It is to remain with him, and he is to read it every day as long as he lives, so that he will learn to fear Adonai his God and keep all the words of this Torah and these laws and obey them, so that he will not think he is better than his kinsmen, and so that he will not turn aside either to the right or to the left from the mitzvah. In this way, he will prolong his own reign and that of his children in Israel. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. The priests and the Levites and all the tribe of Levi shall have no part nor inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the offerings of the Lord made by fire and his inheritance. Therefore shall they have no inheritance among their brethren. The Lord is their inheritance as he has said unto them. And this shall be the priest's Jew, from the people from them that offer a sacrifice, whether it be ox or sheep. And they shall give unto the priest the shoulder and the two cheeks and the more. The first fruits else, the, 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 sorry, the first fruits also of the corn of thy wine and of thine oil and the first of the fleece of thy sheep shalt thou give him. For the Lord thy God has chosen him out of all the tribes to stand to minister in the name of the Lord, him and his sons forever. And if a Levite come from any of the gates out of all Israel, where he sojourned, and come with all the desire of his mind unto the place which the Lord shall choose. Then he shall minister in the name of the Lord his God, as all his brethren the Levites do, which stand there before the Lord. They shall have the portions to eat beside that which cometh of the sale of his patrimony. When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations, evil practices, of those nations. They shall not be found among you any that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, 
or that uses divination or an observer of times or an enchanter or a witch or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a neocromancer. That's a medium. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. That means entirely obedient. For these nations which thou shalt possess listened unto the observers of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not allowed thee to do so. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him you shall listen. According to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more, that I die not. And the Lord said unto me, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not listen unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I re will require it of him. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet has spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. Shabbat Shalom. It's another exciting day in heaven, isn't it? As he keeps telling us what we need to do, it's important that we have instructions from him to follow him. Because Yeshua said the kingdom of God is at hand. That's why we're going through the repentance book at the moment, right? To get to that place. Anyway, continue on in Deuteronomy. When the Lord your God cuts off the nations whose land the Lord your God gives you, so he gives us a land. And you dispossess them and settle in their cities and in their houses. You shall set aside three cities for yourself in the midst of your land, which the Lord your God gives you to possess. You shall prepare the roads for yourself and divide into three parts the territory of your land, which the Lord your God will give you as a possession, so that any manslayer may flee thee. Now this is the case of a manslayer who may flee there and live. When he kills his friend unintentionally, not hating him previously, as when a man goes into a forest with his friend to cut wood and his hand swings the axe to cut down the tree, the iron slips off of the handle and strikes his friend so that he dies. He may flee to one of these cities and live. Otherwise, the avenger of blood may pursue the manslayer in the heat of his anger and overtake him because the way is long takes his life, though he was not deserving the death, since he had not hated him previously. Therefore, I command you, saying, you shall set aside three cities for yourself. If the Lord your God enlarges your territory, the Lord enlarges our territory, not us. Just as he has sworn to your fathers and gives you all the land which he has promised to your fathers. We're going to see that. If you are careful to observe all the command which I command you today to love your God walk in his ways always then you shall add three more cities for yourselves besides these three 
So innocent blood will not be shed in the midst of your land, which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance, and blood guiltness be on you. But if there is a man who hates his neighbor and lies in wait for him, and rises up against him and strikes him so that he dies, and he flees to one of these cities, then the elders of the city shall send and take him from there, deliver him into the hand of the avenger of blood, that he may die. You shall not pity him. You shall not purge the blood of the innocent from Israel. That is may go well with you. We don't do that anymore, do we? You shall not move your neighbor's boundary mark, which the ancestors have set in your inheritance, which you inherit the land that the Lord your God gives you to possess. A single witness shall not rise up against the man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. If a malicious witness rises up against the man to accuse him of wrongdoing, then both the men who have the dispute shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who will be in office in those days. The judges shall investigate thoroughly, and if the witness is a false witness and he has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him just as he intended to do to his brother. Well, that's quite severe, I tell you. God. Thus you shall purge the evil from among you. The rest will hear and be afraid and will never again do such an evil thing among you. Thus you shall show no pity, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for foot, uh, hand to hand and foot for foot. Chapter 20. When you go out to battle against your enemies and see horse and chariot, a people more numerous than you, do not be afraid of them. For Adonai, your God, the one who brought you up from the land of Egypt, is with you. When you draw near to the battle, the Kohen will come forward and speak to the people. He will say to them, Hear, O Israel, you are drawing near today to the battle against your enemies. Don't be faint-hearted. Don't fear or panic or tremble because of them. For Adonai, your God, is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. The officers are to speak to the troops, saying, What man has built a new house but has not dedicated it? Let him go back to his house, otherwise he might die in the battle and another man would dedicate it. What man has planted a vineyard but has not put it to use? Let him go back to his house, otherwise he might die in the battle and another man would begin to use it. What man has become engaged to a woman but has not married her? Let him go back to his house, otherwise he might die in the battle and another man would marry her. The officers will speak further to the troops and say, What man is afraid or faint-hearted? Let him go back to his house, so he does not weaken his brothers his brother's heart like his own. Then when the officers have finished speaking to the troops, they should appoint army commanders at the head of the troops. When you go near a city to fight against it, call out shalom to it. Now, if, an, if, it, an answer you, if it an answers you shalom and opens up to you, then all the people found in it will serve you as forced laborers. If it does not make peace with you, but makes war against you, then lay siege against that city. When Adonai, your God, hands it over to you, you are to strike all its males with the sword. Only the women, children, livestock, and all that is in the city, all its spoil, may you take as plunder for yourselves. So you may consume your enemy's spoil, which Adonai, your God, has given you. Thus you will do to all the cities that are very distant from you, which are not among the towns of those nations nearby. However, only from the cities of these people, which Adonai your God has given you as an inheritance, you must not let anything that breathes live. You must utterly destroy them, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Jebusites, just as Adonai your God has commanded you, 
You are to do this so they will not teach you to do all the abominations as they have done for their gods. And so you would sin against Adonai your God. When you lay siege to a city for a long time, making war against it to capture it, you are not to destroy its trees by swinging an axe at them, for from them you may eat, so you shall not chop them down. For is the tree of the field human, that it should enter the siege before you? You may destroy and chop down only the trees that you know are not trees for food so that you may build siege equipment against that city, the city that is making war with you until its downfall. Shabbat shalom. And you miss this place when you miss one week. Yeah, um, okay, Deuteronomy 21. Suppose a slain person is found fallen in a field on the land of Adonai your God is given you to possess. Who struck him is unknown. Then your elders and judges must come out and measure the distance to the towns that are around the slain one. Now the town nearest the slain one. The elders of that city are to take from the herd a heifer that has not been used for work or pulls a yoke. Then the elders of that city are to bring the heifer down to a flowing wadi that has not been ploughed or sown, and break the heifer's neck there in the wadi. The Kohanim, the sons of Levi, will come forward. For Adonai your God has chosen them to serve him and pronounce blessings in his name, and by their mouth every dispute and assault is to be settled. All the elders of that city, nearest to the slain one, will wash their hands over the heifer whose neck was broken in the wadi. Then they will answer and say, Our hands did not shed this blood, nor did our eyes see. Grant atonement for your people, Israel, whom you have redeemed, Adonai. And do not put innocent blood on your people, Israel. Then atonement will be granted to them for the blood. So you will purge the guilt of innocent blood from your midst when you do what is right in Adonai's sight.
Mm-hmm. I, even I, am he who comforts you. Who are you that you are afraid of man who shall die? and of the Son of Man, who will be made like grass. Have you forgotten the Lord, your Maker, 
who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. Do you live in fear continually? All day because of the fury of the oppressor when he prepares to destroy? Where is the fury of the oppressor? The captive exile will speedily be freed. He will not die and go down into the pit. His bread won't fail. For I am the Lord your God who stirs up the seas so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. I have put my words in your mouth and have covered you in the shadow of my hand that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth and tell Zion you are my people awake awake stand up Jerusalem you who have drunk from the Lord's hand the cup of his wrath You have drunken the bowl of the cup of staggering and drained it. There is no one to guide her among all the sons to whom she has given birth. And there is no one who takes her by the hand among all the sons who she has brought up. These two things have happened to you. Who will grieve with you? Desolation and destruction, human and the sword. How can I comfort you? Your sons have fainted. They lie at the head of all the streets like an antelope in a net. They are full of the Lord's wrath, the rebuke of your God. Therefore, now hear this, you afflicted and drunken, but not with wine. Your Lord God, your God who pleads the cause of his people, says, Behold, I have taken out of your hand the cup of staggering, even the bowl of the cup of my wrath. You will not drink it anymore. I will put it into the hand of those who afflict you, who have, who have said to your soul, Bow down, that we may walk over you. And you have laid your back as the ground, like a street to those who walk over. Awake, awake, put on your strength, Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, Jerusalem, the holy city. Shake yourself from the dust. Arise, sit up, Jerusalem. Release yourself from the bonds of your neck, captive daughter of Zion. For the Lord says, you were sold for nothing, and you will be redeemed without money. For the Lord God says, now therefore, what do I do here, says the Lord, seeing that my people are taken away for nothing? Those who rule over them mock, says the Lord, and my name is blasphemed continually all day long. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, they shall know in that day that I am him who speaks. Behold, it is I. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes. have seen the salvation of our God. Depart, depart, go out from there, touch no unclean thing, go out from among her, cleanse yourselves, you who carry the Lord's vessels, for you shall not go out in haste, neither shall you go by flight.
Shabbat Shalom, everyone. That it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. We heard that and heard that. <coughs> but I tell you, do not resist an evil doer. But whoever slaps you on, the, on your right cheek, turn to him also the other. And the one wanting to sue you and to take your shirt, let him also have your coat. Some of that might be going to heaven to us. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who asks of you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Chapter 18, verse 15, restoring a lost brother. And brothers, in this sense, means fellow believers. And this is how we are to handle disputes and issues within our, our church, our fellowship. Now, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, his fault, while you're with him alone. He listens to you, you have won your brother. You've won him. If he doesn't listen, take with you one or two more. That's followers. One or two more, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may stand. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to Messiah's community. And if he refuses to listen even to Messiah's community, let him be to you as a pagan and tax collector. Amen, I tell you. Whatever you forbid will bind. Whatever you forbid on earth will have been forbidden or bound in heaven. And what you permit or loose, whatever you permit on earth will have been permitted or loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in their midst. And um, thank you so much for the prayers because, you know, our leadership prayed for us before we went and we needed every prayer. And God was amazing. Yahweh is our light and our deliverance. I'm sure we fear he's the refuge of our life. But he, just to say that he, um, we got out with one day to spare after booking three weeks before. There were two lockdowns and a quarantine. We got out the next day and then coming back, we um, were the second to last flight and many people missed out so we were very very fortunate to get back so this is my present land and I am so thankful to be back in it thank you for your prayers okay so I'm reading from Acts 3 and Kepha and Yohanan were going up to the set apart place at the hour of prayer the ninth hour and a certain man lame from his birth was carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the set-apart place, which is called Yapa, to ask alms from those entering into the set-apart place, who, seeing Kepha and Yohanan about to go into the set-apart place, asked for alms. And Kepha, with Yohanan, looked steadfastly at him and said, Look at us. And he gave heed to them, expecting to receive whatever from them. But Kepha said, I do not have silver and gold, but what I do possess, this I give to you. In the name of Yeshua Messiah of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And keep walking. <laughs> and taking him by the right hand, he lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones were made firm. A quick testimony. Uh, seven, yeah, we stayed at my daughter's house, first of all, and all was accomplished to help her in her difficult pregnancy in her first trimester, 
and uh, then we went across to Mordura and Ali saw her dad for the first time in seven years, so that was amazing, and they bonded beautifully. So that was good, but I want to share you very, very quickly about seven years ago, when my, I was in that same place where my daughter rang me and said, Mum, we've just had our first little Maddie Rose, and she's so beautiful, but she was crying because her foot was turned completely 180 degrees to the back. And they had said that she would have to have plaster over and over again in that first year. And um, I just couldn't bear the thought. I, I fell on my face before God, and he said, go and get corporate prayer. It's so powerful when you all pray for each other. You have no idea. And in these last days, close to the Lord's return, it is vital. Yeah. So I went and grabbed anybody I could and asked them to pray for that next week before I left and got the church praying and the, um, and the prayer team, anybody that would pray. And so when I got there a week later, her foot had actually turned 30 degrees of the 180. So that was cool. And then every day... Rochelle and I laid hands and continued to pray, and every day it would turn 10 degrees. Wow. And then, oh, I know, it's amazing. And then on the last, um, and, and then at the end of that time, uh, God said, now I want you to pray and fast because this is from generational dark sin that this has happened, and I want you to pray and fast, and, um, and then I'll answer the prayer, and I want your whole family together. Well, if you knew how impossible that was at that time, but um, they, I gathered them all together. We got together, read them bits in the Bible, and then we prayed for that child. And the next morning, of course, we went through to try and undo the bandages and see what had happened, and the foot was completely around to the front. Praise God! 180 degrees in one week. And then six months later, they rang me and had a tear again and said, her foot won't roll her over. It's in the front, but it won't roll her over to help her roll at six months old. So once again, they bought me a ticket, come over to pray and lay hands on that little thing and join them for, in prayer. And the moment we walked in from the airport, uh, his, my son-in-law got me, he went, oh, it's a miracle, it's a miracle, because little Maddie Rose took off with that foot. It's like it went into action. So it shows us that we, we can read it, we can, we can soak it in, but boy, do we have to action that out. And, and she's now the fastest runner in the stall. <laughs> so praise God. Amazing. So, okay, so they were leaping and leaping up. He stood and walked and went in with them into the set apart place, walking and leaping and praising him. Don't we praise him for our miracles? The miracles of provision. And all the people saw him walking and praising Elohim. And they recognized him that it was he who sat begging arms at the lovely gate of the set apart place. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what befell him. And as the lame man who was healed was Langing to Kepha and Johannes, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Shalomith, great, uh, Shalomith, greatly amazed. And seeing it, Kepha responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us, as though by our own power or reverence we have made him walk? The Elohim of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Jacob, the Elohim of our fathers, esteemed his servant, Yeshua, who has delivered up and denied, and has, who you <coughs> delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the set apart and righteous one and asked that a man, a murderer, be granted you. But you killed the prince of life, whom Elohim raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And by the belief in his name, this one whom you see and know, his name made strong, and the belief which comes through him has given him this perfect healing before all of you. And now, brothers, I know that you did it in ignorance, as your rulers did too, but this is how Elohim has feel, filled what he has announced beforehand through the mouth of all the prophets, that his Messiah was to suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn back for the blotting out of your sins in order that times of refreshing might come from the presence of the Master and that he sends Yahweh Messiah, a uh, Yeshua Messiah, pre-appointed for you, whom heaven needs to receive until the times of restoration of all matters of which Elohim spoke through the mouth of all of his set-apart prophets since of old. For Moshe truly said to the fathers, 
Yahweh your Elohim shall raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. Him you shall hear according to all matters, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every being who does not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Such a solemn warning about unbelief. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Shemuel and those following have also announced these days. You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which Elohim made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, Elohim, having raised up his servant Yeshua Hamashiach, sent him to bless you and turning away each one of you from your wicked way. <coughs> oh, I want a glorious inheritance. Yeah. Yeah. Shalom, everybody. Shalom. Therefore, let us approach the holiest place with a sincere heart and the full assurance that comes from trusting, with our hearts sprinkled clean from a bad conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us continue holding fast to the hope we acknowledge without wavering, for the one who made the promise is trustworthy. And let us keep paying attention to one another in order to spare each other to love and good deeds, not neglecting our own congregational meetings as some have made a practice of doing, but rather encouraging each other. And let us do this all the more as you see the day approaching. For if we deliberately continue to sin after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. But only the terrifying prospect of judgment, of raging fire that will consume the enemies. Someone who disregards the Torah of Moshe is put to death without mercy on the word of two or three witness, witnesses. Think how much worse will be the punishment deserved by someone who has trampled underfoot the Son of God, who has treated as something, something common the blood of the covenant which made him holy, and who has insulted the Spirit, giver of God's grace. For the one we know is the one who said, Vengeance is my responsibility, I will repay. And then said, Adonai will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Fun games with the uh, internet for some reason. But Malcolm's still back on. <laughs> and same with uh, Kathy and Bryce. <clears throat> Lost a few others. <clears throat> Last week's parish up. <laughs> the air to see actually focused on the precept that life is about choices. A life of obedience to Yahweh and his commandments will lead to certain blessing, but turning away from God into idolatry will surely bring curses on individuals in the nation. <clears throat> choices we make affect more than just ourselves and they create consequences. Including in this, we're, uh, we're, we're making uh, choices about who we listen to 
and spend our time following. And Shimshon brought the challenge that many are caught up listening to false prophets and often referred to these days as Facebook prophets and prophecies, which are gleefully forwarded on without verifying their authenticity. And many have lost sight of the true role of the prophets in prophecy. And it's actually less about <clears throat> predicting dates and happenings, but more about exhorting people and nations to repent, turn from their ways, and turn to Yahweh Elohim. And that's the thing that um, many You've got to realize that flip your focus back on what it actually the purpose of the prophetic is to do and it is to wake people up yeah. to enliven people it's not it's not really necessarily there for the main purpose to uh give them some guarantees about what happened is happening down the, down the track <clears throat> that's really a byproduct and that actually is what is utilized to verify whether or not the prophet or the prophecy, prophet, prophecy is correct and whether or not you should stone them or bother listening to them anymore. That's the, that's the component which actually is the recovery. It's a bit, it is a bit like grace. Grace, don't be saved, but was out the um, evidence for this. I think the question is, have we received the grace? So it's a bit like prophecy. The prophecy is mainly for drawing people back to God, establishing in their heart who He is. That's for the entire world mm. to turn their hearts towards Him. Yeah. And but the spin off and the side part is that whoever's giving a prophecy. Better make sure they got right. Yeah. yeah. The Lord God, um, <clears throat> are you sure the Messiah came under the curse and broke it, uh, providing the narrow path that leads to life? And sadly, it seems that few choose the narrow path. Most walk the path, um, the broad path to eternal uh, destruction, desolation. Shaul urged us to urges us to make deliberate choices every day to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, and that's what Shimshon was making the the point strongly that. Um, you know, we, we are the example, we are the witness that people are going to see. We are often the, the prophet, the prophecy that they mm -hmm. people actually look to before they actually look to anything else. Mm -hmm. So it's important that we <clears throat> focus on what God is wanting. The things that happen and ha are happening are just like signs of the times, just recognize it. Yeah. But continue to be witnesses and live life. Mm. And be effective and powerful. Good. And uh, stand up, be counted. Mm. <clears throat> and make sure that they want to listen to people that want, actually want to listen to you as well. Bershat, uh, Shoftim or judges, which he derives the word from Shafat, uh, which means to, to judge or govern. He commences with the uh, judges and officers you are to appoint with all your gates that Adonai your God has given to you. And as you see, Elohim is making a point throughout the readings that he is the source of giving. And it does so that we will do likewise. In his giving nature, he is the God who is 
the just, uh, who is just and advocates pure justice. He stimulates the setting up of uh, several, several institutions and all their relevant supervisory regulations for the future administration of Israel's national life. In fact, as was pointed out in the first reading, our systems of democracy and judiciary are based on many of the principles that are prescribed. And sadly, many have been eroded due to the hardness or the arrogance of man's heart. We see this in the very current and blatant erosion of democracy being displayed in parliament practices throughout the world, including New Zealand. New Zealand Aotearoa, or Aotearoa New Zealand. <clears throat> Our close neighbours, Australia and Israel. What's happening in all those parliaments? They should all know better. But they are, they seem to be, there's an interesting word, hellbent. I don't usually want to use it, but it's almost like the hell bent right. on um, yeah. destroying democracy. Yeah. yeah, it's true. It's weird. That affects the entire parliament. Um, <clears throat> uh, the judges and the officers, such as arbitrators, were provided with clear guidance guidelines on how to behave regarding just conduct, idolatry, and the consequences of such, such practice and actions to take. If they can't, if, if they couldn't deal with the issues at hand, they were to call the Levites and the priests. And the main reason being was because they heard from God. And that's the link that's kind of missing in most components being but to keep God out of it. You know, keep the God factor entirely out of it. <clears throat> so hence any justice and any judgment is going to be skewed towards Satan. You leave God out of it? That's the way that's the way it is. Yeah. It's going to be so skewed towards Satan. That's why we need to be the light, not as priests of Yeshua's kingdom. In Hebrew, in, <coughs> in Hebrew uh, justice or tzedek is closely tied to the idea of righteousness and holiness. In fact, the words righteous, tzedek, and charity, tzedeka, related to justice, tzedek. It only follows then that uh, God, who is holy and righteous, is also just. He is called the Lord of our righteousness, Yahweh Zedekinu. The righteous God, Elohim Zedek, and the righteous judge, Shofat Zedek. The prophet Isaiah declared, but the Lord Almighty will be exalted by his justice, his mishpat, and the holy God will show himself holy by his righteousness, by his tzedekah. That's Isaiah 5 verse 16. And the foundation is, the justice is the foundation of the Torah's humane legislation. God also requires that Israel be characterized by righteousness, integrity, and charity. When the righteous thrive, it says the people rejoice. Yeah. And when the wicked rule, yeah. the people groan. Yes. yes. Interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Where there is no justice, there is no appreciation of the rights of every human being to be treated with fearless respect and kindness. Yeah. And if I was you, I wouldn't like to be living in Afghanistan right now. 
I mean, one thing is to pull the pin. It's another thing to blatantly say, I don't care. Mm, yeah. Because we should care. Yeah. We should care. Where there is no justice, uh, there is appreciation of, the, of there is no appreciation of the right of every human being to be treated fairly. Mm. Those who oppress, mistreat, or take advantage of others, especially orphans, widows, and actually just while we got on that, um, Divya wasn't online because she's actually on a train going to pick up a couple more um, orphans and to take them back to the orphanage. And they're actually doing very well. And I've got a whole lot of photos. It's got, I'll need to flip them up, but I need to get around to it. <clears throat> A little bit sleepy this morning. Yeah. And where there is no justice, there is no appreciation. Um, what is the end result of justice and righteousness? <clears throat> Peace, shalom, and security. The fruit of righteousness will be peace. The effect of righteousness will be quietness. And confidence forever. That's Isaiah 32 17. We can see why it's so important that everyone in the position of authority needs to be righteous and just, including our government leaders and officials, our bosses, our teachers, and even fathers and mothers. And Moshe prophesied that they, Israel, would establish a monarchy. That was actually happened four, years, four centuries later. It was actually uh, a requirement of the kings who write uh, copies of the Torah. And they had to write the Torah themselves so that they would never stray from God's ways. That's why I encourage you, it's, it's good to just learn some scriptures on behalf. So it burns in your mind. So when you're asleep or when you're having a nightmare or when you're getting frustrated by someone down the street, yeah. this scripture comes to you. Yeah. A word. Yeah. The king was also to live modestly as our leaders so that their heart may not be lifted above his brothers and that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right or to the left. And the, actual, the word for king in Hebrew is, is malak. You must know that. The root being mem, lament, mecha. And it actually makes for a verb which means to consult, consider different what views such as, for example, in Nehemiah 5, 7, where it's translated serious thought, where to give serious thought to, or consulted, that he will be consulted. And thus, the king is to be consulting and considering different views, a far, very far cry from the common idea of kingship, um, certainly from the one that prevailed at that time. Maybe the modern monarchies are closer to it these days. God never intended for Israel to be ruled by a king, and like the ones found in the pagan nations especially. God chose David to replace Saul after his uh, disobedience because he was a man after his heart, who would rule that was righteousness and justice it's not to say that David was a perfect man. No, he was an adulterer. He was a murderer. And yet, despite his brazen sin, David, David was also God-fearing, a humble man. And he did repent of these terrible transgressions, especially when Nathan, Nathan, the prophet, confronted him. This quality is essential to righteous authority. A willingness to listen to godly rebuke and to repent and turn back to God. The King of Israel was to be a model of justice and righteousness, an example to the rest of the nations to follow. 
And the king wasn't to gather for himself a bevy of beauties or piles of money. Indeed, he was to treasure the book of the law, the Torah, and diligently read it. He was to fear Adonai and keep his laws and his statutes. It's interesting that in British society, is also, which is based, and, and, and ours is based on Judeo-Christian principles, um, so that when the, the British monarchs, well, that used to be, when they used to be crowned, uh, they were presented with a Bible along with the words, we present you with this book, the most valuable thing that the world affords. Wow. Here is wisdom. This is the royal law. These are the living oracles of God. Wow. Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life mm. to all godless, uh, godliness mm. and reverence. And that's verified in 1 Timothy 2. Yeah. 1 to 2. Yeah, now, the ideal Jewish king or leader is unique amongst nations. He is supposed to be a servant leader. That is, he's supposed to be scholarly, not a halfwit, pious, not of himself, righteous, not godless, and to be God-fearing, to love the ways of God. He's someone who encourages the, people, the Jewish people to fulfill their mission to be the light to the nations. And Yeshua, of course, he was perfectly the model, the person who modeled a servant leadership. And he also trained his disciples in this style of leadership. Now, you know that uh, rulers and, the, and Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercised authority over them. And it's interesting, a good leader will also be confident in who they are themselves. And, and uh, they won't uh, stifle debate and conversation. And uh, they're, they're never afraid really of people attacking their, their um, position because they are confident in who they are. And because people trust them. And trust is something that you need to learn to earn. That's true. Good. Very true. You know, the leaders of the Gentiles lure it over them, and their high officials exercise over them. Not so you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. And just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Matthew 20, 25-28. And you're sure the eternal king of Israel who rules and reigns on the throne of David in righteousness, just judgment and justice. And when Isaiah prophesied about the Messiah, he wrote that a child would be born, a son given, and the government would be upon his shoulders and the increase of his government and the peace, the shalom, there will be no end. And upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to, to order it and establish with a judgment, mishpat, a justice. Isaiah 9. Also, it's important to note that according to Deuteronomy 17, Yeshua is a true king of the Jews. He must keep the Torah all the days of his life. Is he alive or is he dead? It's an interesting thing, isn't it? Was he from the beginning? Or was he not? So did it disappear when he died on the cross? I mean, it's, it's a little bit mathematical. I just ask these questions because just like I'm an engineer, so quad <laughs> quadratic equations, you know, if you have this and that, plus that, then it's got to equal this. If you take something out, but it doesn't, the logic disappears. But not everyone likes logic. 
um, Yeshua was not above the rule of the Torah. <laughs> He must keep the Torah all days of his life and carefully observe all the words of the Torah and not turn aside from the commandment to the left or the right, and that's a requirement of the king. If he'd broken the Torah, he would have committed a sin. And we know that he was without sin. He was able to keep them in the pure sense that they were intended to be followed. Hence, he declared that not one jot or tittle was to be changed. He led by example. And those who are truly in Messiah, Yeshua, do not uh, need external coercion to keep God's commandments and judgments. For when we have been given a new heart and a new spirit, there arises within us a desire to keep God's laws and commandments, not in a spirit of legalism, but out of a heart of love. It says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will carefully uh, be careful to observe my ordinances. That's Ezekiel 36, and that's very, Ezekiel is a prophetic book, not just for then, but for the future. Uh, for those who believe in Yeshua, Jesus, um, but do not observe his commandments in the Torah, the question we need to ask is why not? If a person is not truly following Yeshua and, and filled with his Holy Spirit, or they have received and accepted a teaching of false grace, which erroneously emphasizes freedom from guilt rather than freedom from sin. It's an interesting different component. Certainly Yeshua did not pay the ultimate price to set us to set us free from bondage to sin so that we can continue sinning without guilt. And everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. That's 1 John 3 verse 4. And this points to the type of leadership that God desires. But he is, must possess, possess a com combination of strength and humility. He must be able to get a job done uh, without bullying and to mm. exercise compassion without belittling. Mm. In all our leadership roles, let us follow Yeshua's example. We need to pray that our government leaders and those in authority over us are wise, just, righteous, so that they may live in shalom, yes. peace. So, so that we may all live mm -hmm. in shalom and oh, peace. God. And when Yeshua washed his disciples' feet, he showed us a beautiful example of how we could both serve um, and lead others. Now that I, your Lord, and your Adonai, and teacher, your, 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 your rabbi, have washed your feet, and that's an interesting one. A lot of people think, you know, um, you know, you sure says the scriptures you're not to use the name rabbi or things. That's for the capital, because he is the teacher. Yeah. Right? It doesn't mean that there aren't other teachers. Mm. And that's what means rabbi means teacher. Mm. Okay, so mm. you, you'll get all these things thrown at you <laughs> along the way. And it's just helpful if someone's had the answer. <laughs> We're not like the answer, but at least it's something to think about. Um, Yeshua also spoke about judgment. He, he cautioned, judge not lest you be judged. Does this mean that we're never to make any kind of judgment about anything or anyone? No. Yeshua warned us to be to judge fairly, without hypocrisy. And to examine ourselves first. Ah, very good. It's a very, yeah. very important. That's, that's the thing with take the thing out of your eye first. Right. Be, be. Okay? So that is, that's the order of things. Okay? There's a righteous kind of judgment that we're expected to exercise carefully. Do not judge according to the appearance, but judge 
with righteous judgment. And this is in John 7, 24. In the end, however, God alone is perfectly righteous and just. Only he can achieve <coughs> that flawless balance between justice mm. and mercy. Yes. Surely the righteous can sleep. Um, still are rewarded. Surely there is a God who judges Shafat, the earth, judges the earth. Psalms uh, 58, 11. We can be eternally grateful that through Yeshua, um, death on this execution state, we've escaped the judgment that we so rightly deserve. Mm, yeah. Hallelujah. Yes. Is that good? Yes. Yeah, we agree. Hallelujah. As long as we walk in Him. We can be thankful that in Yeshua, mercy triumphs over judgment. Yes, yes. That's in James 2 verse 13. This only comes about as Peter proclaims in Acts 3 verse 19. Repent therefore and return so your sins might be blotted out. That's when the mercy kicks in, triumphing over judgment. But it's, it's in Isaiah 53, 5 verse this five says that he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, and the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we were healed. Mm -hmm. We are healed. Yes. It's continuing on. And in the, in the coming days, the veil will be taken away, and we will no longer see through a mirror in riddles. Mm -hmm. But rather, Hanaim El Panim, face to face. Ah. That's 1 Corinthians 13. So break forth together into singing. <laughs> you waste mm. places of Jerusalem, for the Adonai has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. Yeah. Yeah. So Isaiah 52. And on that great day, all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation and righteousness they'll see the judgment of our living god yes thank you god. shalom ubarak lecholam peaceful and blessed shabbat to everybody oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, very good. I'm going to sing them right as I go. I'm singing with Gasto. I'm sorry, you don't sing in tune. It doesn't matter at all.
together.